pulsator and the super pulsator is is interesting because it's a technology that was invented a long time ago like i think in the 60s 1960s like around the time i was born and um i'm sure it was patented for many years i i don't think it can be patented anymore because it's so old it continues to be built there are hundreds of these built around the planet and and the question is how did this technology evolve or what problem were they trying to solve and how did it how did it get to this solution so first thing is there's a vacuum chamber in these plants and they they use that to use a vacuum pump to store a bunch of water in a tank and then they release it and when they release it it goes into the sedimentation tank in like a big whoosh and in that big whoosh it suspends the flock filter and then when it stops going fast the flock filter settles back down again and then they they do it again so what i'm wondering is do you have any ideas why they went to a pulsating system to maintain their flock filter because agua clara evolved and we don't have any vacuum pumps and we have a flock filter so I wish you could be in teams discussing this because I think you'd have even more ideas if you were like debating this. Um, do you guys consider like would would using a, a social media app on the side and chatting with each other on the side would that help you be more brave and asking questions? Um, so do you see the the flock filter is overflowing and going into the flock hopper? It looks an awful lot like what's going on inside an agua clara plant. Um, and they empty their flock hoppers from above instead of from below, um, but the hydraulics is basically the same. They have a drain coming out the top. Um, but I want you to be pondering, why did they go down this path of having a vacuum pump and having the flow pulse? What was the problem they were solving? And as a, as a hint, you might think about what are you seeing in this design that is very different from the Agua Clara design? Who wants to jump in? Question about Super Pulsator, how it works? Why it's so different? Who wants to say something about what you see as being completely different as far as the bottom of the tank? You can see a, a nice view of the bottom of the tank right here. Yeah, instead of just having one central effluent tube, influent tube, they have a bunch and they're all facing a different direction than we have ours. Or it's the same direction. Or it's the same direction. Who knows? But there, it's like there aren't dividing walls. Yeah. And what else is missing? Oh, the jet. And it's, there's no, there's no jet reverser. There's no jet, there's no jet reverser. And what else is missing? Anyone can jump in. Maybe it was so obvious you were already saying it. If you look at the bottom of that, of the said tank, what's its shape? It's just flat. It's flat. And I think I showed you some videos of what happens when you have a flat bottom of a sedimentation tank. Anyone remember? Even though you have water blasting down on the bottom, sludge still settles on that bottom. And so we have this video showing you can't build a flock filter on a flat bottom. So they're trying to solve the problem that we were trying to solve. We couldn't figure out how to suspend a flock filter on a flat bottom sedimentation tank. And we invented the, the hydraulics with that jet reverser so that you resuspend all the things that settle out. They went down a completely different path 
And they're just like, we're just gonna blast water into the bottom of the sedimentation tank really fast. And, and that will stir it up, which kind of works. Um, I think there's all kinds of problems with this approach. Um, not least of which, well, what do you think? I said that if you have sludge in the bottom of a sedimentation tank, it's gonna go anaerobic and it's gonna produce bubbles. What do you think about their system? Are they gonna have sludge in the bottom of their sedimentation tank that's not moving? Yeah, there's, there's maybe there's, there's ports in the bottom of those launders that are directing water kind of down, but in the middle between two, between two launders, there's two launders, right? And in between two launders, there's gonna be a dead spot where there's gonna be sludge sitting. So they're not gonna be able to move that even, even if they dump water down really, really fast. So they're going to have they're going to have methane coming up through this tank, um, and I I forget do I have? Okay, so the problem they were trying to solve is sludge was just sitting on the bottom of their tank and they couldn't get it to move. Um, they got it to move by pulsing by by having the flow rate go up really really high. Um, it's still going to be anaerobic on the bottom of their tank, and I. I guess I don't have it here, but there's a, if you look up super pulsator tank cleaning on YouTube, you'll find a lovely video of, of some plant operators, I think near Philadelphia that were cleaning one of these super pulsators and they show like lots of sludge and they, they show workers opening up ports, you know, with bolts, removing a port hole, a cover off, off the tank, and then crawling in there. And when they crawl in there, they are in this region. They're below the plate settlers and they're walking on top of the, the launders, the, sorry, the, the influent manifolds. And they're probably going in there with fire hoses and blasting the sludge out to, to get that sludge cleaned out. Um, so even though this is a like semi-automated plant, it still has difficulty with managing sludge. Okay, so that was just, um, my pitch is that there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't work well in drinking water treatment. Um, and I, I'll have a, another connection with that later on. Um, okay, but now to the next task, we wanna get the particles out of water, we've got, We've got green and red flocks and particles going up through plate settlers, and we'd like to capture as many of them as we can and send them back into the flock filter. So we're going to explore plate settlers. And to do that, we're going to build up. We're going to start with the, the simplest of systems, and that is what was the kind of tank that was built first by humans. Just a big, big tank that has flow moving horizontally across it. So a horizontal flow sedimentation tank where the water en enters at one end of the tank and exits at the other end of the tank. And, and then you're hoping that particles settle out. Okay, so, so let's just do a little bit of math. How much time is required for the water to pass through the tank. Well, if we have a certain flow rate and we know that the, this tank volume is W times H times L, if we take the tank volume and divide it by the flow rate, we get a time, theta, okay? That's how long it takes for the water to move through the tank. How far? must a particle fall to reach the bottom of the tank. And to do this, what you do is you consider the worst case scenario. So which particle that's entering this tank has the furthest to drop to get all the way to the bottom? Well, it's the particle that starts at the, at the very top and it's got to find its way all the way to the bottom before it gets to the other end of the tank. And so it has to drop a distance of H. 
And it's got to drop that distance h in time theta. Otherwise, it's not going to get there. Got it? It's got to drop distance h in the time that it takes for it to cross the tank. So how fast must it travel? Well, it has to travel at what we call now the capture velocity, which is a property of the tank. And it's given this tank and how fast the water is flowing through the tank, how fast does a particle have to drop in order to be captured? So the capture velocity is equal to h over theta. And we can then just do some fun with this equation and, and then have another insight. So we're going to get rid of theta. And we're going to put um, theta is volume divided by flow rate. So I put that in there. Theta is volume over flow rate. And then we're going to get rid of volume. And we're going to put volume is length times width times height. And the height cancels out. And so we end up with Q over LW. And then we have this amazing insight. That's equal to Q divided by the plan view area. You see that? It's Q divided by the plan view area. And that means that all that matters for your sedimentation tank is the plan view area. Oh, and depth canceled out. Is it kind of surprising? Depth cancels out because if you increase depth, the water moves more slowly across the tank, but you also have more time for the particle to get to the bottom. And those two effects are exactly the same. So if you're gonna design a sedimentation tank, given that equation, what are you gonna do? Yeah, basically you take a cookie sheet and with, a, with a tiny lip around it and you've got the perfect sedimentation tank. Um, can anyone see one thing that would go wrong if you had a cookie sheet, you know, a, a cake pan that's only one centimeter deep of water, okay? And you've got water flowing from one end of the cake pan to the other end. Can you, can you imagine any failure modes when you do that? This is the fun of engineering. Because if you can figure out what the failure mode is before you actually build it, it's better. Wouldn't it fill up with sediment extremely quickly? Oh, you had one really bad failure mode. Yeah, it's gonna fill up with sediment. And there, there was, because it's a really shallow tank, it's not gonna take long for sediment to fill up. And then something bad's gonna happen. Can you imagine like, like, what, what do you think is going to be bad about having it fill up with sediment? Like what's, what's, what else is going to fail as it begins to fill up with sediment? Like if you were measuring turbidity at the effluent of this tank, what do you think would happen as it slowly fills up with sediment? The, it would just get more and more cloudy. The turbidity would go up, it would like stop working. You're right. Can you explain why? Um, we've eliminated all of the room for like more particles that are in the water that are coming in new to settle out. Now they're That's just skimming the top and they just, you know, bump along. They bump along. Well, that was good. Yeah. They're, no, I, I'm, I'm following that because your logic is good. They have, they have, um, or we have mass conservation. So we know that the particles are gonna go somewhere and we're, we're like, but there's no more room in the tank. So mm -hmm. your, your logic that they probably end up in the effluent is good, but then it's fun to go down the path of, well, why? Like what, what actually makes it so the particles get transported to the effluent? Um, is it because and, they're, sorry, it's because no, the water's ahead. moving faster because it's now it's shallower and shallower. So it's, moving faster, just carrying everything straight across? Yeah, the, the engineering term would be, you've reached scour velocity. So just like, a, just like a stream carries sediment down the stream by scouring it along the bottom, um, it means that there's enough shear on the, on the flocks to transport them horizontally. Hmm. You could do the same thing with sand. 
if you have if you have water flowing over sand, once the velocity is fast enough, it'll start moving the sand bed along. Um, and you could think about sand dunes as something where air was actually scouring the sand to move it along and, and have sand dunes move. So we've demonstrated that this is bad if it gets too shallow. And so we now realize that there are other things that matter besides just the plan view area of a sedimentation tank. Um, but, but we do have this one cool insight. Plan view area is what matters. And if we build a sedimentation tank like this, um, it ends up that the plant or the tank ends up being pretty big. Um, you could do, yeah, okay, forget the math. Just take it, it's big. And so we're gonna wanna see if we can figure out how to make this smaller so it's more cost effective. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, oh, one more insight here. Will this tank remove any particles that settle slower than the tank's capture velocity? Is there any particle that could find a way through this tank where it would land on the bottom, even though it's settling slower than the capture velocity? Uh, maybe you have to take, make some more assumptions. Let's assume that particles are actually effectively being injected all along that entrance face. So one face of the rectangle, somehow we've made that whole face be maybe perforated with orifices, with holes, and there's water flowing through that entire face. Now, can you see a path that some particles could make it to the bottom? Because the particles that enter near the bottom of the tank don't have to fall very far. So with a horizontal flow sedimentation tank, it does capture some particles that are settling slower than the capture velocity of the tank. So there it is. That particle that we caught was settling slower. We still caught it. Um, and so that answer is yes. Question? Vertical flow tanks. So now we're gonna change the geometry completely. We're gonna have the water entering from the bottom face of the tank. And, and like this immediately has some problems, right? Like, well, where does the sediment go in this case, right? But bear with me. Um, so we have water entering at the bottom. How long does it take for the water to pass through this tank? Well, it's gonna take the residence time of the tank, theta again. So that was easy enough. Now this one's a little trickier. How far must a particle fall relative to the fluid to not be carried out of the exit? So in that time theta, how far must a particle fall in order to not be carried out? It has to be, it has to fall exactly as far as the water went up. So during that time, the water went up a distance h. So the particle in order to not be going up has to be falling a distance h. So we've got to fall h in that time. So guess what? It surprisingly is the same equation. The capture velocity is h over theta. We can do the same exact same substitutions we did in the last slide. And we have that the capture velocity is the flow rate divided by the plan view area. Kind of cool, kind of confusing. So now we have, this is, a, this is just the way it is. And one way to think about it is it's, it's, a, it's the bottom of the tank that is where things can settle out on. Um, it's what gravity is acting normal to. So that's what we need more of. We need more place for flocks to be able to settle out, more, more area for them to settle out. And that's what determines how effective this is gonna be And so then, then you like, well, why don't we go back to this system? Why don't we just put two cake pans on top of each other? Why don't we just make a bunch of small tanks and have them on top of each other? Why wouldn't that work? Right, because if, if I have a whole bunch of tanks stacked on top of each other and I have water flowing through each one, then I've effectively 
increased my plan view area. But the problem is I have to figure out what to do with the sludge. Sludge is a problem. See, Cornell University has a water treatment plant that was built in the 1920s, I believe. And it's still rolling along. And it's got a horizontal flow sedimentation tank. And that sedimentation tank is probably like about four meters deep, like 12 feet deep. And during the course of the year, and especially when there's a really turbid, when there's runoff in there, in their in Fall Creek that they're using as their water source and the water is really turbid, that sedimentation tank begins to fill up. And so every six months um, when students are on break, they take down one half of the sedimentation tank, they go in there with fire hoses and they blast it out and they have a drain that it can go down and it goes out to some lagoons. And it gets deep. I don't remember how deep it gets, but I think it, it may get like eight or nine feet deep of sludge a lot of sludge, okay? So if we had a bunch of shallow tanks, that becomes more problematic. And, be, and if we're gonna send humans in there to clean it, then it has to be kind of six or seven feet tall so that people aren't complaining. Um, and all of a sudden it's not so shallow after all. So it's, it feels like we're going down a non-productive path, right? Having a bunch of tanks stacked on top of each other is not the great solution. And instead, Um, we're going to invent plate cellars. We're not going to invent them. They were invented a long, long time ago, but we're going to use plate cellars. So here's the, some guidelines on capture velocity for sedimentation tanks. Um, and we'll, we'll connect with how you actually design a, a tube cellar in, in, or a plate cellar in just a little bit. So Brent Wood Industries out of close to my hometown, Reading, Pennsylvania, makes tube settlers and they recommend between 0.12 and 0.36 millimeters per second as the capture velocity. That means you take Q divided by the plan view area of that system and that's what that capture velocity is. Um, for horizontal flow tanks, capture velocity is between 0.24 and 0.72 millimeters per second. Um, Agua Clara, we looked at those numbers and because in the beginning we didn't use filters, we were very interested in being conservative on our flocculation and our sedimentation side. And so we adopted 0.12. So we took it right off of Brentwood Industries off of their website and used that. Um, and, and then just a reminder that now we have some messy equations that are actually pretty easy to use um, if we know what zeta is that give us a connection between uh, a, the required capture velocity or the maximum capture velocity and what are, the velocity gradient is inside our flocculator. Um, in any case, we ended up using 0.12 millimeters per second for our design. And we're all about making sure that we have a plate settler that has a capture velocity that's small enough so that it reliably captures the flocks that we need to remove. Um, is it clear to you? Oh, is it clear that a good sedimentation tank has a small capture velocity? Capture velocity is always confusing. Capture velocity is a property of the tank or of the plate settlers and it says, how fast does a particle need to settle in order to be reliably removed? So if you have a capture velocity of a millimeter per second, that means that a particle has to settle at at least a millimeter per second to be removed. If you have a capture velocity of 0.1 millimeters per second, now you can have a particle that's settling very, very slowly and you will still capture it, okay? So a low number for capture velocity is good. Usually, Big is good, here, small is good. That makes sense? Okay, so let's do it. Um, we're going to look at plate settlers. So now this is very different geometry. Now we have plates at an angle and we've got particles flowing up between, the, we got water flowing up between those plates and 
And there's our critical path that we've got to have particles follow. And we have to figure out what does this notion of capture velocity mean on a plate seller? Um, so there's a couple different things that have to happen here. The flocks have to be able to settle and land on the plates before the water exits. So that's about the capture velocity. Um, and it must not slide or roll up the incline. Um, I will, um, I'll use this as a constraint to tell us how close together we can put plate settlers before we run into trouble. Um, and it has to roll down the plates and combine with other flocks and land back in the, in the flock filter uh, and become a contributing member of society or a contributing member of the flock filter. So here's the critical path for capture. You saw it on two slides back. There it is. That's what a particle is going to do that we just barely capture. Or really in a, in a plate settler, maybe it looks more like, oh, I guess I didn't do that. OK, so that's, that's the, the path that that particle actually takes. So that's the critical path. And our goal now is to turn that into a capture velocity. So let's try it again. Here it is. What's that path? It's this, this is the path. It has to take that slight angle and slowly get to what it sees as the lower plate, right? It's in between two plates. It always ends up in the lower plate. During the time that the particle took that path, what did the water do? You know, the water, okay, I have a couple of vectors at the bottom here. There's VZ plate, that's the, the vertical component of velocity between these plates. And then there's the angled component of velocity, which is, oh, this is, this is one of those things that I think students find confusing. And I, I find confusing too. When water, enters plate settlers, we're gonna take a vote just for fun, okay? So gird yourself. We're gonna take a vote. When water is going up through the flock filter and then is gonna enter the plate settlers, when water enters the plate settlers, does it keep going the same velocity? Does it speed up or does it slow down? Um, so think about this for a, a second. Water's going up and then there's these plate settlers above it. And to make your life easier, you can, you can pretend that the plate settlers are infinitely thin just to avoid that confusion. Okay, so you've got these infinitely thin plates and I wanna know, does the water speed up or slow down when it enters those plates? Oh, look at Pat. Pat is super. Oh, are coming in. It's a, it's a close race. So a couple more and then we'll, we'll close the poll. Wow, look at this. Isn't this great, guys? You know, what's fascinating is, I think you realize that there's actually one answer that's right. And yet, you're all over the place. And it's because this idea is confusing. Um, so how do we think about this? I, like, can you think of any relationships that are at least like friendly for us for helping to figure this out? And, and what's unfortunate is I did not come to class today thinking, realizing I was going to take you down this path because I forgot that this is like a critical question. Um, so I have to think about what's going on here too with like, what's the physics? Anybody think of, of some physics that might help us here? 
some relationship that that might be that must be true. That flow has to be conserved. Excellent. Yeah, so we can call that continuity or mass conservation. Somehow, the water that's going up into these plate settlers has to leave them at the rate that it's coming in. Um, oh, well, look at that. That does it very nicely. Compare the width between the two bottom points of the plate settlers, compare that width with the perpendicular width, S. Which one's greater, S or S over sine alpha? The opening at the bottom. Ooh, so this, do you see this? S over sine alpha, this opening at the bottom of the plates is actually bigger than S. And at the bottom is where the water is entering vertically. And then it takes a, burnt, a turn. And in order for that same flow rate, because the area is less as it's going up at the angle, the velocity had to increase. Oof. So. Is this, is this craziness? We should, we have to decide whether or not we want to buy physics. Um, so it does, the water actually speeds up and, and you know, that was actually hiding there in my two little vectors at the bottom the whole time. There's VZ plate, that's the vertical component of velocity. V alpha plate is in the direction of the plates and it's a little bit bigger because now the velocity, the, the water has both a vertical velocity and a horizontal velocity that gets you the V alpha. Okay, so it actually speeds up. Um, okay, and I needed to know the water that was carrying this particle up through the plates, how far did that water travel in the time that it took for the particle to go along its critical path. And I'm gonna put this in here because it's just, maybe it's also a surprise. Look, it had to, hang on. It landed way up there at the top of that arrow. Now you're thinking I'm really bonkers, right? The, the water, that was traveling straight ended up at the top of that arrow. And during the time that the water was traveling up between the plates, the particle was settling down at its terminal velocity. And it was doing that the whole time. And so let's see what happened. That, that arrow is the distance that the particle traveled down while it was being carried up by the flow, right? It's, it entered right next to the top plate. It exited on the bottom plate. So it traveled the red line vertical distance. And, but it ended up at the top of the plate. So what happened is the water traveled from this bottom entry point all the way to the top of the red arrow. While that was happening, the particle traveled a distance of the red arrow down and that got it to follow the blue path. Okay, so the blue path is the combination of what the water did and then what the particle did relative to the water. Um, so we can figure out what HC is. It's at that vertical distance between the plates, S over cosine alpha. Um, what's the total vertical distance that particle will travel? Um, the, it, actually, it actually travels distance H, right? During the time that the particle is traveling between these plates, it actually travels distance H. Um, 
and that's equal to L sine alpha. And its net vertical velocity is, is the addition of how fast the water is traveling vertically minus how fast gravity is pulling it down. So you got water carrying it up, gravity pulling it down, and VZ net is uh, the net velocity of that particle in the vertical direction. So it's traveling a distance h at its net vertical velocity, and it's traveling a distance h c at its terminal velocity. And that's going to be our little trick that we're going to use to solve this. And oof, I uh, I feel like equations are always a pain. Um, I'm hoping that you like followed a little bit about how those vectors work. We're going to take the two times, the time to travel distance hc and the time to travel distance h. Those times are the same because it, it's just that's how long it took for this particle to get to where it landed on the lower plate. And it travels a distance hc at, a, at its capture velocity. That's how far it had to settle to get between the two plates. It, it travels a different distance h at its net vertical velocity. And then we can do a bunch of substitutions. And I think at this point, I'm just going to fly through these because you don't want to see it, OK? I'm just going to go to the last equation, which is a lovely relationship between the vertical velocity entering the plate settlers and the capture velocity of those plate settlers. And it's the addition of one plus L over S times cosine alpha sine alpha. And what does that mean? Well, VZ plate is a big number like a millimeter per second. I know that's not very big. VC is a tiny number, like 0.1 millimeters per second. So VZ plate over VC is a number something like 10. And cosine alpha and sine alpha, um, when you multiply them together, I forget what it ends up being. I think it's something like half, roughly. Um, which means that L over S has to be a big number, like 20, in order to make this work. So that's indeed how plate settlers work. They're, they're long and they have a short distance between them. And that L over S is what determines like how efficient they are. Um, so we did all of this because we didn't want to build a huge horizontal sedimentation tank because a big horizontal sedimentation tank is expensive. And this is going to save us a ton of money because we can reduce the overall size of the tank by the factor. So if VZ plate or VC is a factor of 10, then we can reduce the size of the sedimentation tank by a factor of 10. And if you had a factor of 10 increase in your salary, you would get excited, right? So a factor of 10 is a cool thing. Um, and it means we're saving that much money on these sedimentation tanks, except we're going to invest more in plate settlers. But plate settlers are cheap compared with all the concrete. Um, so here's our design. We use a millimeter per second up through the flock filter. That determines the plan view area of the sedimentation tank. We use 0.12 millimeters per second as our capture velocity in our plate settlers. That determines how much plate settler area we need. Um, but then are you wondering, like, where did this 60 degrees come from? Like when Rojas pulled that out of the air, just like, oh, 60 degrees. Where did that come from? Any ideas? And while you're thinking about that, remember Monroe's rule, go to extremes. You've already gone to one extreme today and thought about failure. So go to both extremes and think about failure and then think about like what, what's good about being in the middle.
okay, that is your question that you can answer in your team, okay? You're trying to understand why is it good to have plate settlers that have some angle, which Monroe randomly pulled out 60 degrees. Not all plate settlers are at 60. Some are at slightly shallower angles. Um, I don't think there's anybody that goes steeper. Um, and the question is, what fails if you go to 90 degrees or if you go to zero degrees and, and what is good about being in the middle? That's your question. I'm gonna come around and meet each of your teams uh, in Gather and you can tell me what you figured out on that. And, and while I'm not getting to your team, you can be working on Flocculator. Okay, see you in Gather unless there's a question here. All good? Okay, see you in Gather in a minute.